Good morning, everybody. Thank you for getting up early. I hope you're all on East Coast time. Um, I am very excited about uh, presenting to you uh, some trend archetypes about your industry because your industry has been uh, so influential in many other sectors over the past 18 or 20 years. Um, that's why I've entitled the session A World of Folk because it really is a global movement and uh, this is a slide to explain to you that we've actually been talking about the influence of craft since uh, about 1998. And I remember that uh, the person that I work with, Lee Edelcourt, said to our audiences that no sector, no industry in the world is going to be untouched by the handmade trend. And so we live at a time when uh, consumers are really understanding that things which are personalized and unique are actually um, very marketable and very appealing. And so the idea that uh, tactility is of the most importance is actually key because the more and more uh, virtual we, we become, the more and more tactile our fingers get. And so touch is actually the um, most important tool that most consumers, of course, use to um, make their purchases. Um, and so over the years, we have uh, called it different things. In the beginning, it was handmade, then it was unique, then it was personalized. And now we talk very much about the maker. And the maker is important because we see that with the intervention of the hand, that um, objects and products are actually being infused with the soul or the spirit of that person. And so consumers are now understanding that when they purchase something which is unique, that actually it's infused with some kind of energy force or soul. Uh, we also live at a time when there are major uh, shifts in society. And so today we're going to be talking about uh, eight different archetypes. And these are influenced by what we call lifestyle trends, things that are around uh, not just for a few years, but actually for 10, 20, or even more years. And one of them is your audience, which uh, I know that often we think about uh, a certain age bracket for your clients. But today, people's uh, age doesn't necessarily match their physical age. You can have uh, very, very mature young people and very, very uh, young at heart older people. And also, as the older we get, uh, we're living much longer. And so people are actually dividing their lives into new chapters. And so after when you retire at 60 or 65, you might go back to school, or you might take a new uh, apprenticeship, or you might become a weaver, or you might do whatever it might be. So this idea of a no-age mentality is actually very important to consider, and uh, that your market is actually evolving and opening up. The other uh, key influences is that um, lifestyle, things like food, of course, the pet industry is actually a major industry which influences the way that we relate to our animals as if they're also one of the family. And this idea of family becomes more and more important because one of the biggest changes today is that men are um, much more sensitive and much more involved in parenting. So this is a new male archetype who's very, very sensitive and very present uh, in his children's lives, and therefore also a major new sector for you to think about as far as not just looking at him as a DIY or carpenter or handyman, but actually that he is also an embroiderer and a knitter and a floral decorator. The other big uh, shift that has happened in the past uh, 10 or 20 years is that we've moved from being a uh, pyramid society or a, a vertical society into being a horizontal organization. This means that people today are used to the idea of working in teams, of collaborating together, of uh, learning from people that are more experienced than them. So this idea of passing on a craft technique or passing on knowledge uh, becomes more and more important for many young people today in the uh, millennial generation. The other thing about the millennials is that they exist because they've been brought up with uh, screens all of their lives. They actually exist between 2D and 3D. So they want to have something which is handmade and something which is made by them, but they can also do it with technology on their computer screens. They, of course, are tuning into all of your videos to learn how to do things practically rather than reading instructions as many of us used to. 
And so this idea that between flat 2D-ness and three-dimensional uh, tactility and uh, object uh, becomes a sort of uh, interface between uh, two different spheres. So millennials are actually, for them it doesn't matter if it's 2D or 3D because they're so used to swapping back and forth. And so this idea of uh, three-dimensionality is interesting to think about as we uh, look at all kinds of craft techniques here, embroidery on a photo, but really to explain to you that whether uh, the technique is done on something like concrete or paper or wire or cardboard or latex or plastic or whatever it might be, actually today in design and in interiors or even in uh, decorating, it actually doesn't matter that you mix different materials together. We used to have styling where we would say, oh, it's all about wood or it's all about velvet. But actually today you can use plastic and metal and wood all in one object and it actually becomes a new way of juxtaposing things together. So I wanted to introduce to you, uh, if I have time, eight archetypes uh, to talk about the importance of the creative consumer. Uh, this is a uh, major archetype in trends that we refer to on a regular basis, that we tell all sectors, whether it's fashion or cosmetics or food or cars, whatever it is, it's about explaining to our, our clients that uh, these consumers are interested in being included in the making process, that they want to be um, part of the finalization of the product, or they want to be able to modify it to their liking, or they want to be involved maybe in voting for something by saying, okay, I'm gonna choose this brand because they're ethic ethical, and I'm going to have connection maybe with a weaver in India because I'm gonna see through an application on my phone who made my garment or who made my blanket. So there's this new, uh, I would say, interactivity of uh, the creative consumer, which is very, very important today. So we start with the crafter, which of course is um, the most obvious uh, major part of your industry. People who are obsessed with um, expressing their creativity in a very uh, free way. So they make and imagine their own products. They use yarn and they do embroidery. They're embracing color. Um, they use and embrace all kinds of new techniques such as not just embroidery on furniture, but also uh, using things like photo printing to be able to personalize a wallpaper or digitally produce something onto their furniture. Uh, the art world has uh, seen a recent uh, big revival in uh, textile art, and so whether it's embroidery or weaving or knitting, all of these um, techniques are actually being embraced again uh, for the first time since the 70s in the art world. And so culture at large is actually focusing on this idea of things which are very, very handmade and uh, almost like Sunday artist type um, objects. Um, as I mentioned, there is a revival of weaving that's taking place right now, uh, in particular hand loom weaving. This uh, in fashion is actually where textile uh, designers are making small run uh, pieces of fabric which then get transformed into a garment. And so the textile is actually the design much more than the actual uh, garment construction. And so the idea of loom uh, weaving actually becomes a major focus again. And there's lots of uh, small studios or schools or classes popping up and it's very important that schools in particular don't get rid of all of their looms and only switch to digital um, computer um, rendering because of course, as we all know, without the loom, you don't understand the complete essence of what a textile is. Uh, in design, we've seen all kinds of coiling and wrapping techniques. The idea of using colored yarn in particular to embed or wrap up. Sometimes people use machines to wrap these kinds of chairs or it's also used, um, embedded into a mold and then stabilized using an epoxy or another kind of glue. This idea of oversized yarns uh, becomes very inspiring for design today. In particular, the idea of a large gauge knit, whether it's for a blanket or a rug 
or a giant cushion. In the beginning, this trend was very much influenced by the idea of uh, the dollhouse and taking small proportion um, pieces of furniture and then blowing them up for human uh, size. And so it's a little bit like Alice in Wonderland, like the idea of oversized then becoming very small and playing with that proportion. That's why a lot of this oversized knits have been so uh, prominent. Uh, the creative consumer, of course, is also interested in doing their own thing at home, not just making murals, but something much more simpler, which is uh, just getting some paint and transforming one wall in their space, or even in a public space like a restaurant, by just putting polka dots on it in a very free way. This is like a new motif that uh, we see all around the world. And polka dots and round shapes are actually um, a big force in uh, design today. Of course, uh, when the movement started in the late 90s, uh, we saw the revival of uh, quilt making, uh, in particular here in the United States. It was all about uh, rediscovering American folklore, Americana, all of the different craft techniques that our forefathers and mothers were all um, in love with, uh, suddenly became uh, a major expression in people's homes. So of course, uh, today you might be seeing that there are uh, blankets which consumers can even embroider upon because they have perhaps an embedded grid that can guide them onto this kind of pattern. Or, of course, in the marketplace, you see uh, products like these which are sold uh, ready-made. But also very inspiring to see how um, thrifty a lot of these crafters are because they'll use all kinds of remnants, as you know, to uh, transform something like this cushion. These are just shreds of old pieces of material. Uh, yarn, of course, is um, a huge part of the uh, uh, craft industry, in particular for knitting. Uh, in the last uh, 10 or so years, we've seen not just wool being used, but a revival of the use of mohair. Um, now, when we look at uh, other yarns, we think about more hard to find uh, animal fibers, like perhaps yak or all kinds of goats. So people are interested in connecting uh, not just the color and texture of the fiber, but really thinking about what kind of animal does this come from? What am I wearing? Am I wearing a goat, or am I wearing sheep, or am I wearing an undyed black wool from a black sheep in New Zealand who's very healthy and free? So they're very interested, like in our food, to understand what is the origin of this ingredient. Um, the idea of uh, dyeing and color has become uh, a major focus in all sectors. As we've seen in the hair industry, uh, young people are embracing uh, dyeing their hair in all kinds of uh, shades, whether it's pink or purple or turquoise. Um, and what this means is that not just makeup, but also hair color can be considered a craft ingredient. And so maybe in your stores, you should also have a sort of beauty section where people can not just buy tattoo transfers, but also dye their hair, um, have creative makeup, clown makeup, whatever it might be that you're focusing on. Uh, stenciling is uh, also uh, part of this 2D, 3D um, language that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we've seen all kinds of um, small objects as well as large interiors which are uh, embracing this idea of stenciling. And this is a photo that we made in one of our magazines, which was just to announce this uh, trend emerging um, about 15 years ago. It's really interesting, of course, to play with this um, idea of um, positioning things over where the pattern goes. Uh, color in general becomes more and more sophisticated. And so if you're working on paint or pencils or markers, uh, it's important to understand that people's tastes are evolving to be not so basic and primary, but actually very nuanced. And so uh, whether it's the importance of monochromes, which is very hard to do because you have to be very precise when you're doing monochromes, that everything is the right um, value. Uh, or in this case, you might be using even things like uh, natural dyes in pencils or in markers. It's just important to understand that color is really a branding device that is used in products today and that your consumers are also becoming more and more aware of not just the names of colors being persimmon instead of orange and very precisely dictated like that, but actually understanding that if they're going to choose green, that they're going to have maybe 10 greens to choose from and not just one or two. 
Um, along with uh, hand loom work, uh, we've also seen the revival of basket weaving recently. Uh, in particular, in design today, we see lots of wire constructions, whether it's for baskets or even for furniture, uh, which are for indoors as well as for outdoors. And what this means is that basket weaving kits uh, can actually become uh, an easy way for uh, non-professionals to learn how to make their own um, little baskets. Of course, it's also interesting to think about color in this, whether selling the raffia or the materials in uh, different colors or allowing them to perhaps coat it with a very thick uh, spray paint later. And of course, focusing on selecting the right shades of natural materials. Um, the idea of creating uh, furniture accessories is also really interesting. These are small uh, gifts that you can make for your friends and family, especially around Christmas. Everybody is cold and they start working on the bus or on the subway going home. And so this is just to show you that whether it's jewelry or even little socks for a table or a chair, that there are uh, very new to be invented, um, very, very fun things to do. Um, the idea of intervening in the finalization of a textile, for example, is also very important. And so even uh, thinking about rolling on color is a very free artistic way that you can uh, either add a, a touch of color into your product with your interior or just uh, have this idea of a very creative um, origin to the, to the object. So roller paints, um, whether they're in small shapes or in bigger shapes. Rollers, of course, are something which consumers continue to understand very easily. And so in this interior, we see that it's even interesting how people are much more experimental and that if they start doing something that may be unfinished is just as beautiful as finished. So of course, in uh, your sector, we've seen all of these new forms of uh, embellishing materials by decorating them with these um, block print cutouts on rollers. I like this one very much because it's a rolling pin, so it's almost like cooking, more to do with like screen printing or the action of doing something flat, which of course is very practical. Uh, and later you will see that even of course on walls, uh, people have been embracing that. So the urbanite is another uh, archetype, and by the way, with each of these archetypes, it doesn't mean that they're individual people. It's actually more about character traits that each of us have. And so one person might be two or three of these things. And between uh, consumers, all of these things sometimes merge or uh, blur, or uh, you might have your bathroom in one style and your kitchen in another. So it's important to think that these archetypes are actually very multiple. The urbanite is uh, this younger generation that uh, I guess you're all thinking about. Now we call them the millennials, but there is a generation after them, which we refer to, I think, as Generation Z now. And um, these young people, of course, uh, have very different behavioral patterns than our generation does. And so it's important to understand that they're much more hybridic in the way that they think. So that means that in their interiors, they're going to blend uh, many different tastes together and be very irreverent about it because young people today aren't so focused on art history or learning all of the rules. They don't even, like we used to be taught that you had to learn the rules in order to break them. This generation actually doesn't even need to know the rules because they can reinvent everything on their own terms. So they can embrace something which is industrial as well as something which is handmade all at the same time. Something which is completely contemporary and also very ethnic at the same time. So all kinds of uh, new materials are being embraced, whether it's drier um, materials such as raffia or string, which can be made into uh, larger objects. Knitting as such is a very powerful um, uh, metaphor for today's society because it's very much about bringing people together. And so maybe this is why knitting has become such a major force, not just people getting together to knit in groups, but also the actual construction of it. And of course, in the sock industry, we've seen a major interest in creative socks. And so lots of people today are, of course, wanting to make their own. And so it's almost like you have to have a special pattern just for all kinds of different socks because it's not just about 
needing any old sock. It's about a specific uh, gauge, it's about a specific length, a specific elasticity that people are interested in learning about to become more and more professional. So like in the food industry with people wanting to be chefs in their homes, the um, general public is also wanting to learn more uh, and become more and more professional. Uh, as I mentioned before, the idea of using remnants is important uh, to this generation in particular because they believe in recycling and not wasting anything. We're in year, I think, eight of the, or nine of the financial crisis now. Uh, it's really a new way of thinking where um, we don't want to just um, recycle because it's about the planet, but it's actually more about being thrifty and not and be and using everything about the product. Fashion designers today redesign their pattern making so that they can use all of the material, and they're very proud to say that they have close to zero waste. In the food industry, like in butchering, for example, people are interested in eating all of the animal, and so there are butchers who specialize in cutting all of the animal parts. So in the same way, this generation is not interested in wasting things. Uh, in the urban sphere, materials, new materials like concrete are, of course, very influential. And so uh, in the craft industry, it's important to reinvent uh, powders which can be mixed up at home to make um, sculptures, to make molds, to resurface things. The paint industry is already there with many different treatments which you can do to walls to make them look like concrete. And so we see that even in smaller objects, even furniture pieces, it's, it's an interesting new thing to think about. But also I wanted to show you this image because it's a little bit inflated, so it's probably a mold which was taken from a cushion and then used to, to uh, cast the concrete. Because the idea of inflating things with air is also a big trend in design today. Uh, making things lighter in the industrial design sector, it's actually so that the transport is more economical and better for the environment. But as a material, this idea of fluffiness, clouds, uh, cushions, even the importance how we all wear duvet jackets today, it's all about this movement towards much more sort of quilted um, form. And within that, the idea of baking, such as in this chair on the right, which is a Japanese chair, which is baked in this sort of uh, bamboo uh, circle, and then it rises. So again, this idea uh, that there is a making process or a sort of uh, germination process in the, in the product is very interesting to people's imaginations. And so they fall in love with it because they know that like a piece of bread, this material is just like yeast inflating and growing. So as we move forward, more technologies are going to allow us to um, sell materials to people, which by adding perhaps water, they're going to just blow up, like these sponges that we've seen on the market, which is sold flat, and then inflate. So just think about this when you're searching for um, a material providers in order to uh, make a, a fun intervention for the, the general public. The other thing which is very big in uh, interiors right now is the revival of marble, uh, not just as marble and stone, but all kinds of marbling techniques. And so in many cases, people are recycling uh, materials such as plastics, different kinds of PVCs, bus tickets, uh, refrigerators, whatever it might be. Uh, young people today are interested that the recycled material becomes like a, um, uh, a natural element like iron or clay or, or wood. And so they're um, interested in seeing a new life for these things which are being recycled. Almost like a crazy magician is putting something into a machine and out it pops, not just through rapid prototyping, but also into a mold such as these plastic uh, marbles. What's amazing about all of these new marbles is that um, they, of course, don't have to represent natural colorways. They're made up of all different kinds of colors, uh, which are all fantasy driven, and therefore you actually see that it's not a natural piece of marble, and you're proud of that. So these uh, younger people, I guess the most important element to understand is that uh, they embrace both old and new in their lifestyle. 
They want to have, of course, the latest technology, whether it's an iPad or uh, something that they're using in their everyday lives. But at the same time, they want to have a piece of vintage furniture in their interior to remind them of nostalgia, to remind them of childhood memories or their parents' generation. I mean, a lot of this idea of uh, revivals or older generations from 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s, whatever it might be for them, of course, they were never even there. So it's all in their imagination. And that's why they attach themselves to things which have age and therefore value. This generation, of course, is very much into improvisation, uh, into pop-up events and pop-up society. And so things like uh, cardboard or even open source projects uh, become very interesting to them. This is a very famous chair on the right, which is actually uh, sold to the consumer in part so that they can put it together themselves. This is not necessarily like at IKEA, where it's about saving money. This is about consumers who want to make it themselves, to be satisfied that they're um, playing a role. And so, of course, with open source, these are things which are shared by this generation because they're uh, understanding that they don't need to own everything. They're a, a movement of non-ownership, if you want. And so um, the idea of being able to download and share ideas freely becomes interesting for them. So if you're selling patterns or designs, you also have to think about whether these young people actually want to pay for it or whether that you should be selling them something else and giving them the idea for free. Uh, as I mentioned before, knitting uh, is uh, very, very popular amongst young people, in particular also with uh, men. Uh, we see them all over the world knitting in public space, at home, for their kids. Uh, it's not at all considered something, of course, just for women today. And this is just an image to show you how we have so many cords today in young people's lives that they, of course, want to almost make fun of them sometimes. So this idea of cording is very interesting. These are simple projects. The idea of mirrors uh, being created. Uh, mirrors are actually a very big trend right now in interiors. And at hardware stores, we even have services where you can, uh, of course, cut them into different shapes, but also etch out perhaps a frame or um, personalize the piece of mirror or tile that you purchase for your products. So if you are working in that sector, I think it's important to understand uh, that maybe this is a new way of thinking of framing, the idea that people can buy a material and turn it into a frame or a mirror themselves, depending on their, their wishes and their individual size. Of course, in DIY, um, all kinds of shelving units and organization uh, systems are very important to younger people because they want to organize their lives. They're trying to make sense of everything, which is quite hectic and unstable today. So they don't know if their job is still going to be there next week. They don't know if they're going to have a terrorist attack in two months and lose their lives. They don't know if uh, their friend is going to get cancer at 30. So everything in their lives is very unstable. And so as a counterbalance, they often uh, like to be very, very precise and organized. Not all of them are this neat, but in general, there is a, a shift towards um, embracing organization. So again, here, it's also a play with pulleys and, and cords. Uh, they want to have at home, not necessarily a garage or entire shed, but at least a creative studio where they can organize in a very aesthetic way, almost like a mood board, their tools which they're going to use to make all of their creative projects. And because cardboard is so important to them, uh, we see that there are also um, very uh, simple ways of doing packaging. The other big thing which is happening in hardware right now is that um, little uh, ingredients are being made in a very aesthetic way. So they're being given very sophisticated colors or made in very precise shapes. So screws and nuts and bolts all become major design elements to incorporate. Again, looking at organization with cardboard, and also the importance of denim today, which is a material which is being revived, not just for jeans, but for all kinds of garments, that it becomes not just a casual uh, textile, but also it's being used in um, uh, more formal wear as well. So the idea of uh, recycling denim is maybe very interesting as we see this return to, to denim. Uh, 
chalk and blackboards are also uh, very popular right now, as you've seen in many public spaces. And so I just wanted to show you that what's interesting about this, um, this project by one of our clients being Q in, in England uh, is that the idea of using uh, blackboard paint is not something just to draw on, but actually that in this generation, which is interested in going between 2 and 3D, that it can also become something which is more multi-dimensional. So that it turns into something which is more sculptural and present in their lives. Illustration is also very important to them, so the idea of personalizing a mural, uh, telling stories, and of course the biggest thing in craft right now is coloring in books, which I never thought I would see the return of, but I'm sort of shocked by the amount of coloring in books which are being sold today. This is an image which we actually uh, created, um, I think in the early 2000s, which was to talk about adults using coloring in books again, but uh, today we see them also being used as a um, way of calming down and being almost like a well-being thing. So the design lab at home becomes important and even the office space can become a creative outlet for these people to calm down during their break. Instead of taking a power nap, you might make a power project where your mind is given a rest from looking at the computer screen and actually interacting with something that is uh, three-dimensional. The archivist is another archetype who's interested in collecting all kinds of things, collecting and organizing, almost like an adventurer or explorer to document and learn about different things, whether it's botany or seashells or uh, butterflies, whatever it might be. So photo printing, of course, for them is very important because they're able to document their collection and turn them into tiles or, of course, make a collage on their fridge of inspiration to really show in their homes that um, their collection is almost like in a museum. So the idea of the museum house becomes really interesting for them, and the idea of display is actually the craft project. In architecture, the idea of photo printing is also being used, and so we find all kinds of new machines which are used, of course, to turn these into different uh, materials. I think an interesting thing to think about is that uh, maybe curtains can also become canvases for people. Uh, to be used like wallpaper is today. And this is really interesting because these are new wallpapers uh, from a French designer by who, who is obsessed with collecting different things. So he is almost sickened by his collection that he decided to just photograph everything and just put it on the wall so he doesn't have to look at it physically anymore. So this idea of um, having uh, printers in your stores which people can turn into wallpapers and even you know, bring in things which they can scan or maybe you have to have a professional photographer that does it for them. Um, you know, this idea of non-ownership is again what is driving this uh, movement towards photo documentation. So all kinds of uh, natural uh, history ingredients are being embraced by these adventurers, whether it's insects or butterflies or botanical prints. Uh, it's also interesting to think of botanicals as something that people can turn into painted murals or wallpapers. And what's great about the plates on the right, of course, is that each person that receives this particular plate is going to have a different plate, even though together they all make uh, one. So historical drawings and illustration are elements which are downloaded or copied from the internet and then used to print. Uh, maps are also a major focus for people today, recycling all kinds of maps, again, making sense of the world by putting it back together again. And uh, the beach coma is also really interesting because he or she is walking along the beach and just collecting different elements from nature, almost in a spiritual way where they're connecting with um, the outdoors, connecting with whatever's gonna wash up. And again, they're not so focused on whether it's a real shell or a piece of plastic which is as beautiful as the shell because to them, they're both natural materials even if it is a piece of plastic which has been washed and washed and worn away. So this is particularly uh, inspiring, of course, for new forms of jewelry or even jewelry for the home, garlands that can be made. And again, uh, looking at how the beach washes up all kinds of um, 
surprising and totally organic materials, which is, of course, what they love, because there is this sort of shift towards embracing this much more primal uh, ingredients, whether it's charcoal or stone or pebbles. All of these things become fodder for um, the beachcomber today. It's almost like uh, a shift towards going back in time to being a prehistoric caveman. And this is why things like paleo foods have also seen uh, a big influence. So that brings us to the ecologist, who, uh, of course, embraces nature, and in particular, natural dyes, uh, which is a big focus today because we're able to sell powders which can be turned into large vat dyes. Uh, so it's not just about using uh, vegetables at home and concocting something uh, which is completely, uh, of course, natural, but also being able to buy an industrially distributed natural dye ingredient. This, for example, is using uh, carrots. So the whole sort of idea that natural dyes become important, whether it's for makeup, for food, for uh, colorways, is really about how people want to obviously understand that the dye has a very safe and healthy um, origin. And this, of course, brings us very new color harmonies for your products, which are totally different to the industrial colors and therefore need to be treated like that. We actually made, uh, for one fashion season, an entire color range of 60 colors just using natural dyes to prove that it is possible for the bigger industry. And so within that, um, these uh, makers are also interested in printing using leaves and other uh, floral in or natural ingredients. So all kinds of printing techniques are being used. This is India Flint, a very famous uh, textile designer from Australia. And of course, uh, in food, we think about infusing our food with natural dyes because of the revival of things like iced teas, which are, of course, very beautiful because they're colored, ice blocks such as these. So in the food industry, it's also interesting to remember that natural dyes are actually the recipe to what people are interested in focusing on. Felting uh, is also experiencing a big revival today, in this case, using natural dyes. And what's interesting for this maker is that uh, not only are they maybe felting and making their own dyes at home, but they're also, in some cases, some designers are even farming their own um, material. So they have a flock of sheep and they have them shorn and then they're uh, spinning their own yarn. So they're actually interested in becoming part of every step of the making process or maybe interacting with other people who are going to help them uh, put this all together. The food industry, of course, is the major lifestyle movement which is uh, the most far-reaching today. And so we think about local ingredients and how people are interested in things which come from around the corner but also to understand what is it that they're putting into their body. Um, is it going to be healthy for them? Are they going to make little landscapes out of them? So this idea that food becomes in smaller portions and in beautiful handmade ceramic plates, obviously influenced by the um, restaurants like Noma, uh, is very uh, inspiring today as a new form of ikebana. The food landscape becomes the new ikebana um, sort of ode to beauty. Um, basket weaving also has influenced the revival of mat making and mats in our homes. So all kinds of natural fibers, sea salt in particular, are seeing uh, a big revival. And sometimes there are even weeds which are turned into beautiful materials which you can uh, purchase or weave at home. So this would be perhaps simpler projects for the house, whether it's um, placemats or even a bigger project, which is very easy to put together because it's just about coiling. Again, like trying to find simple ways of uh, providing patterns and uh, instructions for people to do this at home. Block printing is also part of the handmade movement and in fashion about to re re receive a big revival, we think. And so the idea of uh, making your own block prints becomes interesting because there are all ways of making contemporary block prints, sometimes juxtaposing different patterns upon each other. So really embracing this idea of a much freer, uh, almost messy way of doing um, the motifs. Again, all in natural dyes. This is again to show you how not just for textiles, but also for papers, because of the importance of marbling today, they're all uh, new ways of uh, explaining to people how to do this at home. 
And again, it doesn't have to be in traditional colors. It can be in very fantasy-driven, brighter colors. Uh, marbling has also uh, been used by the activewear industry. Uh, lots of anoraks and techno materials are all printed using photo printing technology. So this is just to show you that even in the natural and ecological sphere, maybe the inspiration is natural, but people are maybe going to also embrace the transformation of that nature into post-technology creativity. The Romantic is uh, another uh, key uh, archetype today. There is a huge interest in romance and lace and craft techniques, of course, and fashion and design at large. And so here we embrace uh, all kinds of volumes, whether it's pleating, uh, smocking, uh, ruching, all of these techniques which create this more romantic sphere. And tomorrow I'll be doing a talk more on all of these craft techniques and how they relate to fashion design in room uh, 213B if anybody's interested in joining us at 10. So what's really interesting here is that through the revival of lace, uh, we see lace being used not just in fashion, but also, of course, for interior products, not just for women, but also for men. So the last Burberry fashion show for menswear was actually all about lace for men. And even though for us we see that lace is coming back, at large, the trend is actually not so much just about lace as it is about perforation. And so for projects like this, such as this um, textile or wall uh, room divider, or a wallpaper, if it might be. Um, the idea of perforation is important, again, because the consumer is able to decide how many holes are going to be used. And so perforation is influencing not just paper, but also textile. And so maybe it's interesting to think about focusing, again, on hole punches and all kinds of um, patterns and shapes that can be used uh, to create these different uh, patterns. Uh, what's interesting about this sort of more frothier tactility, which lots of people are inspired by, is that it's not something that they'll be looking for like a cloud-like paper, but that lace also becomes, in some cases, more about using wool and furrier yarns. Concrete, again, also can become um, romantic, or even a wallpaper, which again is this idea of collecting different bas-relief uh, motifs. And even in public space, things like uh, wire can be transformed into new laces. This is a project from the Netherlands, which is, has been very popular uh, in Europe. This is a beautiful uh, road in Calais, which is the city in France which is most famous for lace, where they've actually paved lace into the floor. So even for people's gardens or driveways, it could be interesting to give them ways of creating their own lace-like patterns in gray and white. And this is a radiator which actually was created about 15 years ago. And for us, this was very much one of the first indicators that we were shifting back towards this um, new romantic revival, which of course is not as in the past, it's completely contemporary. This is why materials like concrete have been embraced by this uh, sector. Within the romantic sphere, it's also interesting to think about um, plastering and whitewashing things, uh, even textiles, really interesting, or furniture having prints which sort of uh, create lace-like effects on natural grounds, or of course the revival of stucco and all of these um, moulage uh, moldings uh, in people's homes to make them a little bit more interior. So in hardware stores, the molding section is actually a very gro growing section. And of course in uh, weddings, uh, we see uh, young women very embracing of this more uh, antique way of dressing to become a little bit more romantic. Also interesting to remember that the guy is as involved in the wedding process today, so projects need to also be created for him. Bridal registries also need to be um, wedding registries. Um, he's really as important as a consumer as uh, the bride. And what this means is that uh, all kinds of craft techniques can be used for projects at home, maybe for gifts that are going to be given to uh, the guests at the wedding, which they can take home and uh, keep a piece of. The culturalist is interested in uh, history 
and in the revival of arts and crafts, or even Bloomsbury, uh, sort of connecting again botanicals and nature to the kinds of um, inspirations that they're going to have. And so Bloomsbury interiors or arts and crafts interiors are also interesting. And I think that stairs are a very uh, important project to think about because in architecture, all of the architects are focusing on stairs right now. And so there may be ways of repainting the steps uh, with different projects that you might be selling. Uh, the revival of arts and crafts today is very important because it's not just about um, the craft itself, but it's actually a response to our technical technological age. So in the same way the arts and crafts started at the turn of the 1900s uh, in response to all of the uh, factory production that was taking place. Today, people are interested in handmade things, again, and in arts and crafts, because it is um, bringing them this sense of a counterbalance to all of the technology. So this means that uh, wallpapers and textiles embrace um, botanical motifs, even looking at oriental motifs, such as cherry blossom, because in fashion and design, there's also an interest in Japan again. In glass, it's also interesting to think like the food about infusing glass. So if anybody's uh, working on materials that can even be coatings or um, blushes, I think the word blush is a sort of key word. Maybe new projects for stained glass windows, which can be made on the computer to be transformed and printed out at your store or using a new paper that's adhesive. And what's important to understand today is that um, uh, with this interest in history uh, and this idea of non-ownership, lots of uh, entities like museums are actually countering everybody's obsession with copyright by opening up their archives. So museums like the Reich Museum in Amsterdam or many others around the world are allowing people to download master's works on their websites to do projects at home. So this uh, is being used to create uh, furniture which you can print or all kinds of projects. And then of course the creative person is able to modify them and transform them into something completely different whether it's stacking and putting back together antique pieces of china, or creating new tattoos, or toile de jouy motifs that can be even colored in on their wallpapers, or even doing pattern upon pattern where for uh, paper plates, the motif is actually the beginning of the design, and it actually becomes cut out uh, instead of the other way around. So starting with pattern instead of starting with form. Another interesting project is to transform old plates by stenciling on them uh, an outline, whether it's a bird or whatever uh, other motif, maybe leaves or whatever it might be. Again, to recycle, but to really give new life to a piece of porcelain which has been maybe previously loved and needs to be updated. It's really about linking back to almost a new sense of folklore, whether it's Americana or Eastern Europe, or wherever your origins are from, to give people a sense of self. The Surrealist is another um, important archetype because it's very much about imagination and dreaming. Uh, we've seen a lot of inspirations in the contemporary art world, uh, looking at uh, fairy tales and telling stories and uh, being a fairy at all kinds of ages. Again, this idea of no age. Of course, the princess trend and the fairy trend are the big focuses for young girls today. Uh, really looking at fantasy as a new realm because of course, with so many bad things happening in the world today, people want to escape into fantasy and make things more magical and have a real experience with their products. Uh, in the food industry, also because things, proportions become smaller, even things like fairy food becomes a new sector to develop as recipes and cake decorating and all of these other more miniature uh, proportions. And that's why also terrariums have become so uh, com uh, popular today, because they're able to create these miniature landscapes like on our plates. So the idea of transforming an imaginative area can be done, of course, with stencils or something as simple as a coat hanger or uh, a mural or a wallpaper or just a cutout, such as the wall on the right. And another big thing in this surreal sector is actually this idea of the circus coming back. 
uh, in industrial design and contemporary design today, there's a shift towards the hoop form, and so maybe there are all kinds of ways that people can turn their hoops or hoop-like structures into new pieces of furniture, not just for kids, but also for adults. And of course, clown makeup is also important. So because of the importance of romanticism, there's all ways of also being decorative, even with things like turning little uh, bits of yarn into pom-poms, perhaps for a party, for party events to uh, personalize a plate by um, sprinkling or splattering paint on it in gold leaf, perhaps. And in uh, colored glass or colored plastics, perhaps. Using them, again, this idea of blush and color, but in this case, playing with different circus-like form and all kinds of uh, yeah, big tent events that you can do at home. Of course, for children's parties, everybody wants to create this little circus at home. Not everybody has the budget, of course, to rent an elephant and a troop, but um, there are ways of still creating a miniature circus, perhaps, at home. The nostalgist is another important archetype because uh, he or she is interested in looking to the past and not being part of contemporary society. Uh, looking at the beauty of vintage, looking at the beauty of nostalgia. And uh, yeah, there's definitely some reason why young people today are so focused on always in the past. It used to be something which would only take place, for example, in Japan, where they were obsessed with vintage and history like that. But today it's really a global movement, particularly for women, for young women. Um, and so of course within this sector, it's very much about the revival of decorating, of um, pom-poms and tassels and all of these things which can completely transform your interior into almost like a, a dollhouse or a Baroque interior or a Victoriana interior. And in textiles, the big um, uh, interest right now is uh, things like velvet and flocked materials and even uh, flannel being used for upholstery, not just for cushions but also for furniture and also in fashion. Um, for boys, it's also interesting to think about the tin man or the soldier or the military uh, uniform uh, as a source of inspiration for very vintage, almost like Jimi Hendrix would wear, old um, grungier uh, garments for all of the inspiration that comes with all of the trimmings. So these are consumers who are interested in becoming new romantics, new Victorians, so the importance of Victoriana is definitely felt um, in our interiors, also creating much more um, romantic um, uh, bedrooms or even uh, boudoirs. So the idea of having a vanity in your bedroom or somewhere where you can get dressed, even like a room divider, all of these things are very um, important, particularly to women right now. The idea of creating an intimate space where she can do her makeup, where she can text, where she can um, work on her computer, but also like paint her nails at the same time, maybe with voice recognition since her nails are wet. Um, and of course, with fashion, it becomes really interesting to look at all of the ruffles and uh, gathered techniques, which again, I'll be discussing tomorrow morning at 10. Uh, in open source, it's interesting to think about the couture industry because uh, couture, just when it was about to die and everybody said it was over, it actually became a major focus in fashion again today because um, uh, people are kind of sick with the fashion industry. They're sick of marketing and advertising taking over and deciding the creativity. As we've seen, lots of fashion designers have been quitting their jobs recently because they're fed up. And so the fashion industry at large is quite sick, not just retail with sales down you know, up to 30 or 40% in many brands, but really thinking about how there's something wrong with the fashion industry. And so in the uh, private sector, things like um, having a dress made become important again because people are looking for different solutions to this problem. Uh, while we see couture 
as creative as ever and in the press being a major focus again, we also think that sooner or later, one of the couture brands is going to release one of their dresses or one of their patterns each collection as an open source um, product you can download and have made at home, maybe with a, a dressmaker or yourself, but just this idea that there isn't this um, gap anymore as there used to be between an $80,000 dress and a regular dress. So it's interesting to see how there are all kinds of small workshops popping up in our big cities today, which are uh, spaces where people can go to sew and use, use the um, machines and facilities together. Or you can also go there and hire someone by the hour to make something for you. So it's almost like the dressmaker um, takes over a public space which is shared in the same way that a lot of people are going to shared offices today. So this could be a part of your store if you're focusing on haberdashery and sewing. And of course the biggest market for this uh, where it started was actually in Japan where people uh, go into stores and personalize something that they just bought. So the idea that you go and buy a garment and then you go to a different section of that store and buy a trimming which is going to make it unique for yourself. Uh, the product on the left is actually a, um, an open source uh, garland by Todd Boncher for Habitat. This has been, um, uh, sorry, it's not an open source piece. It's a uh, made, make it yourself piece, which comes flat. It's using laser cutting on a metal sheet. And so again, it's this idea of the consumer being involved in creating their own little vintage piece. Of course, in furniture, we see a return to these historical motifs, even for tabletop for handles, all kinds of projects which can turn them into these vintage uh, finds. Uh, in textiles and wallpapers, we focus pretty much always only on botanicals or florals today. In many cases, they are perhaps taken from uh, vintage archive uh, prints, not just Liberty, but oversized prints. This idea that wallpaper is important today is really because of the technology is there to allow people to make a made-to-measure, custom-sized wallpaper that's exactly their photo or their motif or their mural. So the printers, of course, being much bigger, allow us to do that. And it's not necessarily something which is, has to be expensive. Um, within this movement, of course, there are still elements, perhaps, of the Far East, of um, flocking a plate or um, coating it in some way to give it a floral pattern. Again, toile de jouy. Uh, again, the idea of the, the mural being important uh, to be painted perhaps in a more faded way. For a consumer who's much more embracing of um, decoration at large. And of course, uh, custom jewelry, uh, fake jewelry as it used to be called, faux jewelry. Uh, is really a focus for all kinds of rhinestones and other gems which are actually quite oversized and heavily influenced by this group of women who are being documented called the advanced uh, generation. So they're very eccentric and they wear all of this crazy big jewelry and they're actually um, uh, an inspiration for young women today. So it's really about how in this embellished new sphere that within um, this world, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, we're able to mix different elements very freely. The image on the right is really a vision of how the interior can be today, which is uh, distributed along the ground, cushions, a natural element, and still a vintage piece. And so while I don't have real diamonds to offer, um, this is just to say that um, congratulations to the CHA for its 75th diamond uh, anniversary. And thank you very much for inviting me over. I hope you have a nice day.